Alhamdulillah <coughs> Uh, up to the th third, fourth of the so as we explained many times, that uh, uh, fiqh is um, split into or made into four parts. So in Arabic, Arabic it's called the ruba. Ruba is the fourth. Okay. So the first one is the ruba al ibada, the fourth of fiqh that is dedicated to the actions of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then after that you have al-mu'amala transactions okay. the third one is al-munakihat so uh, the uh, fourth of fiqh that is dedicated to everything to do with the relationship okay so this would include marriage divorce um, and all the different um, rulings related to both of these so, um, inshallah ta'ala, we will uh, definitely um, have a lot to talk about in this um, section. And we've decided to open up um, entry into the course again uh, in this section because a lot of people are very concerned and keen on understanding the rulings of marriage in Islam, inshallah. <clears throat> now, uh, this section, subhanAllah, uh, is very important for anyone. He wants to get married. So, as we know, and we mentioned many times, that if you want to approach anything in your life, you have to know the rulings of that thing. So, if you want to buy and sell, you need to know the rulings of bank. Just like if you wanted to pray to Allah Ta'ala, you need to know the rulings of salah. And a lot of us might look down upon certain people who don't know how to pray. You know, if we work in Islamic school. And we see kids who don't know how to make wudu, they don't know how to pray. We think, oh, subhanAllah, they spent their whole life, some teachers even, and they don't know how to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality is the same person might be married and not know the rules of marriage. Might be buying and selling and falling into haram. So every single thing you approach, you need to know it's ruling in Islam. That's why um, uh, the uh, great scholar, um, uh, Ibn Raslan, he says uh, about compulsory knowledge in Islam. فرضه علم وصفات الفرد مع علم ما يحتاجه المؤدي من فرض دين الله في الدوام كالطه والصلاة والصيام والبيع للمحتاج التبايع وظاهر الأحكام الصناعية والعلم دائن القلوب المسدي العجب والكبر وداء He says that the compulsory knowledge is first of all to know the attributes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. سر نعقيدة. Simple attributes. And then Whatever you need, ilmu ma yahtajul muaddi is the knowledge that is needed in doing the compulsory actions of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like tahara, salah, and siyam. Whatever you need to make sure that your prayer is right, your salah is right, the tahara is right, that's compulsory. And then if you need to buy and sell, you have to know the rules of buying. Okay? Uh, and then he said the last thing is you also need to know the knowledge that helps you obtain and not fall into the sins of the heart, which is things like um, looking down upon others, um, having uh, kibr, um, seeing yourself to be better than others, being arrogant, um, uh, being jealous from others. You need to know the ways and the keys to getting out of that. So anyway, it's all uh, important knowledge that we study, inshallah ta'ala. Now, um, so, inshallah, we'll just talk a little bit about the concept or the philosophy of nikah in Islam. So, um, what we find is that some scholars, they consider nikah to be one of the transactions in Islam. Okay, why? Um, because there is, in Islam, to get married, in order to get married, there's a contract that happens. 
there's agreement there's an agreement that happens okay so nikah is one of those things that are dependent on a contract that happens between two sides now as we know not all interactions in islam are contracts okay so uh, as we know we studied in in the last uh, few classes that some interactions they don't require um uh, both sides to agree or sign an agreement or say anything. In some cases, you could just take and uh, you don't need to give anything in return. You don't need to say anything. But uh, in other cases, you find that uh, like buying and selling, uh, you need to have both sides agree. Okay? Both sides need to be happy with the product that is being bought and sold. But then do they both physically and verbally have to say that they agree or not? I buy to you and I sell to you. So there's a difference between the scores on that, yes? In the Shafi'i Madhahab, they need to, but in other Madhahab, they don't need to. Okay. When it comes into Nikah, into getting married, it's a lot more strict. Okay. You find that all the scholars agree that there's something physical or verbal that needs to be done. Nikah can't just be, you know what? We know each other. Um, let's just continue to live together yeah in islam no it, there's a sacred contract that is uh, sacred and we're not going to talk about yeah, how sacred it is because that's the thing that's out of fiqh but there's a sp specific contract that needs to be done and witnessed not only done but witnessed by others it has to be something that is known so the conditions are very strict when it comes to nikah more than buying and selling and if you were to make a mistake when you buy and sell in islam in some cases, some scholars say that, for example, as long as both sides are happy with it, there are certain ways that you could you don't have to go back and give product back. You can just continue to use it if you get permission from the owner of the product. In nikah, can't. It has to be done properly with all the conditions, and there has to also be witnesses witnessing how it happens. Okay, and even the witnesses have conditions, so it's very strict in its approach or in in the way we do it. Um, and that's why when we study the details on Nikah, we find that it's not like any other contract. It's very different. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he summarized this. He says, uh, he also says on top of this, He says that the, uh, if you look, look at all the conditions that we've put in our life, okay, the most sacred condition that you would ever have to fulfill in your life, be most serious about, is a condition that you have uh, done and uh, because of that condition, it, it has been permissible to be intimate with someone. In Islam, that's something that is seen to be very sacred. Uh, intimacy in Islam is something serious. Okay, That's why we know that the original case in Islam is that uh, not anyone can be intimate with anyone. Okay, uh, The original case is that it's haram to be intimate with anyone. Okay, but Then Allah Ta'ala, He then allows certain cases. So He allows a certain uh uh, form of nikah of marriage as a contract. Okay, that marriage has that contract has conditions. Built on these conditions, intimacy can happen. There's a limit to it. Who can marry who? Who can't marry who? Who can be intimate with who? It's all, uh, you know, um, conditions. Everything is conditioned. So Islam sees intimacy to be something sacred, something respectful, something that is just open to anyone to, to play around. With. Yes. So, um, the majority. Of these classes, we'll be focusing on who can marry who and who can't marry who, the conditions of the parties of marriage, the way to conduct the nikah, the way it's conducted, okay, um, uh, what's compulsory from both sides to do, what is compulsory, what's compulsory, and the way a marriage can also end in Islam. Now, there are other side topics that uh, might come up in the class. For example, some scholars, when they're studying nikah, they find that it's a chance to mention other rulings that are, uh, have something to do with nikah. It's a, a good chance to mention them. For example, uh, in fiqh, there's no section in fiqh that talks about the rulings that were specific to the Prophet ﷺ, that were different than us. But in nikah, he had specific rulings that were different than us. For example, he, he didn't need uh, the guardian of the wife to marry him off to her. He is Allah Salam, could be the guardian and the one who accepts at the same time. Allah Ta'ala has given him that. And Allah Ta'ala, you know, in some cases, Allah Ta'ala, he's the one who married him off to Sayyidina, Sayyidina Aisha. So it was specific rulings to him. Okay? 
Now, um, uh, for example, Prophet Sallam, at one case, Allah Ta'ala said to him that you can't marry anyone else, nor can you even replace your wife with anyone else. Falas. So everyone else was haram for him for the rest of his life. So uh, Prophet Sallam's rulings are different than uh, to others. Some of these rulings have something to do with nikah. So the scholars in the book of nikah, sometimes they mention all of the rulings, even not related to nikah, that are specific to Prophet Um, For example, after nikah, you usually have a, wedi- a, wedi- a feast, warima. So the rulings of feasting and eating, you find them mentioned in nikah also, for example. Okay, But generally, the main rulings are the ones that we mentioned before, and also interaction between genders, stuff like that. Um, who you can look at, you can't look at. Who you can see, who you can't see. Who you can speak to, who you can't. Those things are all mentioned in nikah. The word nikah is something that we hear a lot. And the definition of nikah in Arabic, they say, is aqtun yatadammanu ibahatu al-wat'i bilafti tazwija wa l-inkahi of tarishamatu. It's a contract between two sides that leads to or that ends uh, with in the permissibility of intimacy between male and female. Using the word tazwija or inkah. So in Arabic, if you marry someone, it has to be done with one of two words. Okay, tazweej or ankah. So, zawaj tuka or ankah tuka. That's how I say it. Or the literal translation of them in the appropriate language. So, if it's not done in Arabic, it has to be the exact same meaning. For example, you can't have someone uh, say, I give my daughter to you. Yeah. In no language, does giving someone to someone mean that you've married them off? Yeah. Or if someone says, um, okay, um, I allow you to marry my daughter. Okay, you've allowed them, but have you have you done the nikah? It's it has to it has to there has to be a wording that says that you have given this person to that person in marriage, something like that. Something very clear. Okay. So in Arabic, it's even more strict. You have to either use the word nikah or zawaj. So ankah tuka or zawaj tuka. Those, one of those two words is nothing else. In other languages, there's a bit of flexibility, but you have to use a literal translation. It has to give the same meaning, basically, in that language. So we use whatever is, um, whatever is appropriate to the language that we're speaking, but it has to be a word that gives the exact literal meaning of Al Inkah or Tazwij. <clears throat> and one of the reasons of this is that in Islam we said the transaction just like Nikah, they're not uh, a transaction that we could judge according to our intentions. Okay. So I mentioned this before. Uh, if someone says that they've married someone after another person, it happens. Even if they were joking or playing around. Okay. Um these things are taken seriously no matter what. Okay. The moment the word is said, even if the attention isn't there, it happens. Okay. And because of that, the wording has to be detailed. It has to be done to the uh, you know, most detailed um yani extent. And uh, subhanallah. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been to any kahra I've done up here. I it came now so I could I'll use an example. Sometimes I might repeat the word a few times or in different languages even. So um, just to make sure that we get the exact right wording. Okay, so um, we did it in English, uh, Arabic, and in um, and in Malay as well. So <laughs> very fine. So the Malay, I didn't, I just said to them, read the translation because I didn't know how to say it. But, yeah, uh, uh, and also our scholars, would, they would repeat it three times as well. Maybe there's a mistake in the wording in the pronunciation one time. So very, we're very keen on doing it you know, to the um, exact, um, you know, like wording that gives the specific meaning in um, in any language. And um, uh, that's because uh, it doesn't count if it's not like that. <clears throat> okay. So, um, what is the rule on getting married in Islam? Should we all get married or should we get married? A lot of people ask this question. Okay. What's your advice? So, alhamdulillah, in the books of fiqh, we find that there's the first thing they mention after the definition of nikah is the ruling of getting married in Islam. Uh, 
so it depends. It's not always the best case for you to get married, and it's not always uh, a bad thing to get married. Okay. Sometimes it's recommended, sometimes it's, not, sometimes it's compulsory, sometimes it's not. So if a one has an urge to get married <clears throat> and has the ability, okay, so they're financially able uh, to open a house, to take care of the expenses of marriage, stuff like that, uh, okay, and pay for the expenses and take care of whatever is required after marriage, it's sunnah for them to get married. So if one has an urge, uh, they feel the need to get married, and they're able to do so. It's not like they're not going to fall into any, um, you know, huge uh, problem if they get married. They don't have any funds. They're not working. No one's supporting them, for example. Then um, they should get married. So a person has an urge, to get married, but is not financially ability. Okay, uh, is not financially able. So, for example, a person really wants to get married. A lot of young people, and they're studying. Uh, you know, they're in year nine or year eleven. Okay, there's nothing they can do. They don't own anything. Okay, uh, so what's the ruling? Is it haram? No, they say it's khilaf al awla. Khilaf al awla. We mentioned a few times what khilaf al awla means. It's similar to being disliked makro, but it's uh, not as dangerous as being disliked. So it's um, it's a, it's like an in, uh, it's like a easier type of being disliked. It's not as severe as something that's makro. So most of our scholars in the Shafi Matab find that they mentioned that khilaf al-awla is like a second degree dislike uh, ruling. And um, usually, it's usually given to rulings that don't have anything from the Prophet Sallallahu saying, Tini, don't do this. But they could be understood from other rulings that they shouldn't be done. Then the rulings that it's disliked so it's khilaf al-awla. If you don't do it, it's better. Uh, it's, inshallah, you get rewarded if you don't do it uh, for this for this reason. Uh, so the translation of khilaf al-awla is not favorable, basically. Okay. And the advice that's got say for this person is that the person uh, is ordered to fast for long periods. Okay. So Prophet says in the hadith, وَمَن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَعَلَيْهِ بِالصِّيَامِ فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ جُنَّةٌ Whoever, he says to the shabab, uh, he says, Ya ma'ashara shabab, oh, young people, whoever can get married, okay, let them get married. So this is the proof that tells us that it's recommended. Okay? لم يستطيع, whoever is not able to, okay, بالصيام, let them fast for long, let them fast, okay, because fasting uh, will restrain uh, the body, will tie the body out, and will um, control that person's urge to get married. Now, the scholars say fasting has to be done for long periods. So, a person should fast every day or two for, let's say, three or four months. Okay, and then <clears throat> they'll be worn out to the extent that they they they're not even bothered to think about getting married. Okay, if fasting is done for short periods only, just for one month or something, we find that it actually might increase a person's uh, urge to get married. So, it's, it has to be done for long periods. Uh, that's the advice for someone who can't physically get married. Okay. <clears throat> If one is worried about falling into zina, so to say, it's compulsory to get married. There's no other way about it. They have to get married. Falling into haram, khalas. They can't control themselves. They're in a uh, situation, a society that has a lot of haram around them. They have to get married. Okay. Um, now, uh, the same things we, we spoke about males, the same thing for females. Similar rulings apply to the females. Um, just um, if you just um, you know um, the opposite black like gender, the same rulings apply. So um, in the case of a lady, if she has the need to get married, and this could be even the need for safety, for example, like the need for anything, okay, uh, then um, uh, she should get married if. Um, uh, she might not be able to fulfill the rights of marriage if she feels that, you know, because it's hard sometimes to, to, to do everything, then they say it's makruh, just like you have to get married. It can be haram to get married uh, in some cases, but inshallah, these will come later on in the course. Now, before a person gets married, if a man wants to get married, 
um, it's sunnah, it's recommended that the person looks at both the hands and the face of the person they are attending to get married to. Um, okay. uh, now, it's only permissible to do so if she's not married to anyone else at that time. And uh, basically uh, not in an idda, so she's not in the period that she is still um, waiting for her contract between her past husband to end. Okay, so just to be free. Uh, mm -hmm. In that case, a person can um, can look at the person they are attending to. Them. <clears throat> now, because we talked about looking, um, the rulings of looking at opposite gender, inshallah ta'ala, we'll mention them now in detail. We've touched on them before, but we'll mention them in detail, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, there's different cases of looking at the opposite gender. It can be unlawful to look at the opposite gender. Okay. Now, we said that if a person is looking at the opposite gender with temptation, it's haram full stop. If they're not married to them. Okay. Now, if there's no temptation, but there's no need to look at the opposite gender. So the person just sitting there looking at the upper gender for no reason. There's a difference between the scholars. The famous opinion inside, uh, according to the later Shafi'i scholars, like even um, like Imam Nawawi and others, is that it's not permissible to look for no reason. Some other scholars say it's not haram unless there is temptation or there is a fear of temptation, fear of being attracted to that person, then it would be haram. So there's a bit of difference around that. That's why we are not uh, too strict about looking at the opposite gender. But if one starts to feel temptation, starts to feel like their heart is um, moving towards the opposite gender, then they shouldn't look at the opposite gender, especially when there's no need. Okay. Um, it can be lawful to look at the opposite gender without any boundaries. And that is between husband and wife. And also um, when they used to be um, slaves back in the day, and their master, then it's also permissible for them to see each other. Okay. It can be permissible to see other than what is between the navel and knees for mahrams on both sides. So the aura between a mahram, whether it's a male or female, is between the navel and knees. Uh, this also includes a person's wife who's on her idda. So a person has divorced the wife, but they're still waiting for them to finish their period of waiting. Then they can't see other than what is between. Uh, what is not between the navel and knees. Um, if a person intends to marry another person, uh, then they look at the hands and face. For medical purposes, the area that is needed to be seen can be seen, whatever the area is. Acting as a witness in a claim of zina or a claim of, of breastfeeding, if you're witnessing that this person breastfed that person, then that specific area may be witnessed. Uh, these rulings are the same for males and females. Okay. That's a summary of the rulings of looking at the opposite gender in Islam. Is that clear, inshallah? Any questions? Okay. Now, all of this uh, is when there's no temptation. If there's temptation in looking, it's only permissible between husband and wife. And the scholars say if a person was to find someone has a, has a, has a sickness in them or something, and they find temptation in a rock or in a wall or in an object. It's haram to look at that object. It's not halal. So it's haram to take, to satisfy yourself, okay, uh, from looking at anything other than uh, your partner in Islam. <clears throat> the pillars of nikah are what nikah is made from. Nikah is made from six things. Husband, wife, wali, which is a guardian, witness number one, Witness number two and the contrast between uh, both sides. So husband would be would be the um, the groom. The wife is the bride. Wali is the person who represents the wife. Witness number one is number two, and then the wording of every one of these has conditions. Once we know the conditions, we know how the kahat is done. This is So. 
the conditions for the husband for the marriage to be correct is number one, he must not be in the state of ihram. Must not be in the state of ihram. What's ihram? When a person goes to Hajj or Umrah, okay, when they pass a certain uh, boundary, we study this in Hajj, okay, they need to intend to enter a state of ihram where certain things that were halal become haram. So they're not allowed to wear clothes that are sewn according to the different body parts. They're not allowed to wear perfume. They're not allowed to do anything like that. Okay? If a person is in a state of ihram, they can't get married. If a person put on ihram and entered the state of ihram but never exited the state of ihram, how do you finish the state of ihram? By finishing your rituals and cutting your hair. Okay? The person never did that. And they go home and they get married. Ten years later, it doesn't count. Okay, so you have to finish your rituals and then leave the state of ihram. And then you can get married. Okay. And that's why it's very important that we, when we do Hajj and Umrah, we're careful on how we do it because it can affect your marriage even if it's years and years later. Okay. Now, if a person done Hajj and Umrah a long time ago, we don't think about how that happened and the mistakes we made because that would start to make a person stress and think, overthink about it. But in the future, if everyone goes to Hajj and Umrah, we make sure we do it properly. And the second thing is to, and also, um, if the husband appoints someone to do the nikah on their behalf, so it's called wikala. When you get someone to do the contract on your behalf, that's permissible. Okay. Uh, then uh, they also can't be in ihram while the contract is being done. Now, the second thing is uh, to not be forced. So someone puts a gun to your head and says, you either marry my daughter or I kill you. Okay. It doesn't count. Um, so they have to be doing it over their own will. And the only situation where a person can force, be forced to marry someone is if a person was married to someone already, okay, and they treat their wife, they treat their wife unjustly, okay? <clears throat> so when they divorce them, the governor, the Islamic government can say to them, no, you have to take her back and give her back her rights first. In that case, a person can be forced to take back their wife, but other than that, um, you can't force someone to marry someone. Okay. Um, now, the person who is getting married, the husband, needs to be someone specific. That's the third condition. So it needs to be specified in the nikah. For example, the person representing the lady would say to the husband, Oh, so and so, I am marrying you, my daughter, so and so. So they would be looking or speaking or naming the husband. Okay? But if he just says, I'm married to someone, he's looking at the wall, he's not. Doesn't mean anyone, doesn't count. It has to be specific. So he would say, like, I marry my daughter to Ahmed or Muhammad, or I marry my daughter to you, for example, um, uh, while pointing at that person. Uh, the, the fourth uh, condition for the husband is that the husband himself knows the name of the bride or the family of the bride or identifies the bride. He knows exactly who he's marrying. So she's specific also. Now, some say, uh, like Ibn Hajar, says that just knowing specific, specific um, specifying the wife is enough. So if the wife is covered in a, in a, in a niqab, niqab or something, sitting there, but they say, I married this lady, then it counts. But if you don't know at all who she is, one of the ladies sitting there, then it doesn't. Okay. <clears throat> the fifth condition is that the husband is a male without any doubt. So it's clearly a male. Um, so we mentioned in fiqh that there's a case when a person um, uh, isn't clearly a male or a female, their organs are not clear. In that case, this person can't get married. This person cannot get married. So it has to clearly be a male or a female. Uh, the sixth condition is that the husband is not a mahram. He isn't related to the wife in any way. And we're going to talk about who is related to who in a few slides, inshallah. So, uh, there's certain people who don't need to cover in front of you. These people are known as mahram, or you are mahram to them. Okay. Um, if they needed to travel, you can travel with them. They don't have to cover their head in front of you. Anyone who doesn't have to cover their head in front of you, you cannot marry. 
Um, and uh, of course, there's certain people who are haram to marry, and we'll mention that um, in uh, in the next class, next slide, inshallah. So, who is it haram to marry in Islam? We'll talk about the female, the male side, and then the female side, inshallah, ta'ala. So, any female origin of yours as a man, it's haram to marry. So, your mother, the mother of your mother, or the mother of your father. Any female origin of you, it's haram to marry, that you came from. Okay? And this includes your mother physically or your mother from breastfeeding. Your mother from breastfeeding is the same thing. So, if someone, if a lady breastfed you five times with the conditions of breastfeeding in Islam, then they become your milk mother. It's haram to marry them. Okay? These are all known in Arabic as al-ummahat, mothers. The second uh, type of person you're not allowed to marry is your female offspring. So your daughter, okay, or the daughter of anyone you legally gave birth to. You gave birth to your daughter, a son, anyone. Their daughters, even if it's 20 daughters down the line, it's haram to marry. Your sisters from any side, half sister, full sister, haram to marry. Okay, your brother's daughter from any side. So your half brother's daughter, your full brother's daughter, it's haram to marry. Your sister's daughter from any side, it's also haram to marry. Your aunt from either of your parents is also uh, haram to marry. If you personally breastfed from someone, you personally breastfed, okay? Not your brother, your sister, you yourself personally best from someone, the lady who fed you becomes your milk mother and her husband becomes your milk father, okay? And everyone else related to them has the same ruling according to you as if you were their physical son. Now, this, this applies to the person who breastfed themselves, not to their brothers and sisters. It's like you are, you enter into that family now. You're adopted by the family. You're one of them, but your brothers and sisters are not one of them. So according to you, they will all be treated as your physical brothers and sisters and um, family, and you can't marry them just like you couldn't marry anyone uh, who you are actually from. Okay. Also, the wife that anyone of your fathers or grandfathers has ever married is half to marry. Okay. The wife of anyone of your sons or grandsons is haram to marry. Anyone they married, you can't. Uh, you marry, and um, female offsprings of your wife are also have. So, if your wife was married to someone else before you, and they have daughters, you can never marry. <clears throat> it's not haram to marry, okay? The lady who breastfed your brother, or the lady who breastfed your son, or the lady who breastfed your grandson, okay? Or the mother of the milk mother of your son or daughter. Okay? Or the sister of your half-brother. Or the daughter of your mother's husband from other than her. Okay? Or the mother of the wife or the father um, uh, so, um, these people we find them fall under categories of mention. Inshallah, we'll go on to the wife now. Uh, so, the conditions for a wife. Now, uh, the wife is opposite. So, brothers, fathers, sisters, the same rulings would apply, but just opposite. Conditions for a wife to get married in Islam, the wife has to also not be in ihram. Has to also not be in ihram. You know, there's a story of one of the people I know. Um, he was in Hajj, and um, Subhanallah, he wasn't interested in getting married. But when they went to Hajj, he was like, you know, Subhanallah, he was in a tent with people, and uh, they were talking. And the person mentioned that you could get married to this person's daughter, and he got very excited. And they went to the nikah in Mina, and he, he forgot the, all the rulings of Subhanallah that it's actually not, not permissible to do it. So they had to wait till the Hajj. So it's not be on ihram. Okay. 
to be specified. So the person marrying off would say, my daughter, so-and-so, this lady, Fatima, Maryam, something like that. Yeah? Um, to not be under a contract of marriage. So if a lady is married to someone, they can't marry anyone else until the, that contract is finished. To not be in a state of idda, so to not be waiting for a um, uh, for the connection or the of the contract of marriage of someone else to still end. So a person has to wait um, for a certain period. We'll take inshallah later on in fiqh um, before they can marry someone else. Um, to be a female without any doubt, just like we said about males, and to be a Muslim or a person of the book if the conditions apply okay so to marry someone who is not muslim so males marrying non-muslim females there are strict conditions it's not a lot of uh people they read the ayah in the quran and they take that uh, and they they interpret it their own ways okay so they read the ayah in surah al-ma'idah it's halal to marry the respectful um, ladies from the book, Jews and Christians. Now, the conditions for someone to be a uh, non-Muslim and marry them is that they come from a lineage that goes back to Christianity and Jude or Judaism from both of their parents' sides until before the Prophet was sent. So they never entered into the religion later on. Okay. Because once Prophet was sent, it's not it wasn't accepted that someone converts into Christianity or Judaism anyway. Uh, the message that Allah has sent was Islam. Okay. So they converted into religion before Prophet and they stayed Christian. These people can they marry. But if they entered later on into Islam, any of the forefathers, you can't marry them. And you can't eat their meat either. And there's other conditions as well. So one of the conditions is that they're not uh, holding on to beliefs that um, take them out of monotheism and stuff like that, for example. Some people might be, call themselves Christian Jews, but they're actually atheists or they don't believe in anything or they worship other things. Okay, um, That all takes them out of being people of the book. So there's many conditions they mentioned, but that's some of them. So I still say today, in the day and age we're in, you can't really find anyone who those conditions, especially with Christians. So, uh, practically, we say that marriage could only happen between a Muslim and Christian. Now, mm -hmm. today, practically. Um, there are exceptions, but find a case where these exceptions actually, um, you know, uh, can be applied, it's very difficult. Okay. The same thing comes with eating meat. Yeah? Some people go to, you go to cold safe and they eat any meat. Plus Christians, yeah. Uh, the condition needs to apply, and the person storing the animal has to also be uh, have this condition apply. So it's not permissible to what people do in the U.S. Basically, with eat meat anywhere. That is not permissible in any madhab. It's not halal. So halal meat is something also very very important. <clears throat> okay. Now, what are the conditions of the guardian of the lady? So in the Shafi'i madhab. A lady needs someone to represent her in marriage. That's <clears throat> seen to be a, a form of respect for the lady. Okay, and it's the same the same thing in all the other madhabs except the Hanif. Hanif madhab, a lady can marry herself by herself. But in the other madhab, the lady needs a guardian. <clears throat> so the guardian uh, cannot be forced to marry this lady off to someone. So someone can't force another person to marry a lady off to someone else. And the only case they can be forced is if the daughter has been asking the person to marry someone who doesn't have any shortcomings. Okay? So Islamically, there's something called a kufr. The person isn't lower than the lady when it comes into their financial status, their religious status, Okay, their um, their um, also their like the status in the community, basically the family, the lineage, and so he's a good person. But the father doesn't want them just because what? Because Wallahi he, he had someone else in mind for him. Okay, 
or the father is trying to stop the marriage because he felt that he wants something better for his daughter. Okay, so someone there's nothing wrong with the boy, but he is stopping his daughter from marrying that boy. Then in this case, the imam can come and can force the father to marry the daughter off to this man. Okay. Second condition is that the wali, the guardian, is free. He's not a slave. He's not owned by anyone. The third condition is to be a male leading, just like we said um, before, to be mukallaf. What's mukallaf mean? Mukallaf means? Mukallaf means that they are um, huh? accountable, yes. So they, um, they are someone who has to pray the prayers, fast Ramadan, zakat, these things. So someone who is a, an, an adult, mature, in their mind, all of these things, yeah? So they have to be in their mind. They have to be uh, aware. To be adil. So religious and trustworthy at the same time. Okay? So someone is known that they drink, for example. Okay? Or they, uh, they don't pray. They can't marry another person. Okay. If we don't know about the case, and that's different. But if you know this person is openly doing uh, major sins, you can't have them marry off their daughter to you. So uh, now, a lot of people in the community they fall into sin, okay. and a lot of people don't reach this criteria. How do we marry them? How do we get them to marry the daughters off? Do we come and say, you know what? You can't marry the daughter off. Look for someone else to represent your daughter. Is that what we can do? That will cause a lot of problems. So what do we do? Rafiq, do you, you have the answer? Do you remember anything? Okay, so also to get out of this, what we do on the day of Nikah is what we request everyone to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Everyone, we say everyone there must repent to Allah from their sins. If they repent in front of us, we take what they say. Okay, we trust that they repent to Allah and that inshallah will take them out of uh, the sins and then we can they can conduct them again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to not be restricted for not being trustworthy. We said in buying and selling that some people can be restricted because they're not stable. Okay, they waste money. Okay. If someone is restricted because of Safa, then they can't conduct the Nikah and to not be in the state of the Haram also. Okay. Who can represent a lady in Nikah? Okay. There's levels of Wilaya. So we start with number one, we go down. Okay. Every one of these levels have, has to have the conditions that we mentioned before. Okay. The first level is the immediate father. Okay. So the strongest level of representing a lady is to be their physical father by birth. There's nothing stronger than that in Islam. Okay. And the immediate father has a lot more power and a lot of more say than anyone else in Islam. There's many other rulings that he specifically has. So if a father is marrying off the daughter, then that is the strongest level of wilaya. No one can come and stop her from marrying the daughter. Okay? As long as the person has, uh, you know, fulfills the conditions, the person he's marrying off to isn't someone who has any issue with them, then no one can, can stop them. If the father is absent, okay, so they're, they're not there, they're passed away or they're far away, okay? Or, in another case, the father might not fulfill the conditions. Okay, we mentioned this condition of the wedding. Who comes after the father? The father of the father. So the grandfather, the great grand grandfather, great great grandfather. As you go up, these are the people who come after the father. Okay. If grandfather is not there, we don't go to the son. Okay. Your son doesn't marry off. Okay. What happens? The brothers of the lady. They become. A guardian, okay. So full brother, full brother's not there. A half brother can also be the guardian of the lady. Um, 
if that is not there, then the sons of the brother, sons of the full brother, and then sons of the half brother, then uh, uncles, then half uncles, okay, um, and then their sons, father's uncle, the uncle of the father, their his sons. Al Mu'atiq means the person who freed that lady from slavery. So if someone bought a, someone who used to be um, owned by someone in slavery and freed them, okay. This person, uh, if there's no one to represent her, he can represent her in nikah. And if that doesn't exist, okay, uh, the person who represents her is the qadi. Is the qadi. What's the qadi mean? A judge. So, technically, there used to be someone who is in charge uh, of every city and the people go to them. And what do they do? They uh, ask the, and they, they appoint them as a judge in any Islamic ruling. Now, uh, of course, in our situation now, we don't have judges. So what people do is known as tahakum, or tahkim, which means that both sides come to a person and they ask them, they say, we have, uh, we request you to represent us in our affairs of marriage. Can you please act as, you know, basically on our behalf, act as a qadi, and that person um can conduct nikah. Okay. Uh, the witnesses in nikah also have conditions. So the witnesses both have to be male. They both have to be free. They both have to be adil, trustworthy and religious practicing people. The same conditions we said with the guardian. Okay. They have to be hearing, seeing and verbal. The witness can't be someone who's blind. Someone who can't hear. They have to be able to uh, basically to see what's happening and convey that to other people. Okay? Um, they need to understand the language they're witnessing for as well. So if we're doing a nikah in Arabic, okay, and we get someone who only understands um, Russian to come and be a witness, doesn't count. Yeah? They don't know what's happening. But no idea. Yeah? Okay? And uh, they both must not be a guardian of marriage. Someone's marrying someone off, they can't be the witness at the same time. Yeah? You can't play two roles in marriage. Okay, the wording of nikah. <laughs> the conditions of the wording of nikah, of getting married in Arabic, as we said, clearly we mentioned this before, is to use the word inkah or tazwij in Arabic or whatever gets gives its exact meanings in another language. So in Arabic, there's two ways to say it. Okay, what are they? You say, the um, wajtuka. So I have done as we. I have the wajtuka. Okay, I've married you after basically. Okay, and then you say so and so uh, ibnati, or like you name name her. Okay, um, that's how you say it. Now, then you can mention more, but that's the, the basic wording. And then the other side says, Qabiltu zawajaha, I've accepted her in marriage. Okay? That's how it happens. So in English, you would say something like, um, I've given you this person in marriage, um, or I've married you up to this person. And you, you could depend on, I guess, um, the way people speak. And then the person immediately, has to be done immediately, has to say, I've accepted her. But you can't say it and then wait. For the person to uh, uh, five minutes and then accept it doesn't work like that so what happens sometimes in nikah is that um uh, after doing seeing the first part people are startled and they start laughing they make jokes it takes a while okay whenever that happens i can repeat from the beginning so people get very frustrated with me <laughs> yeah the, the, okay um so an example of nikah is if Zayd says to Amr, so always we give the example of Zayd and Amr, yeah? Two people. They're just imaginary characters, okay? Um, so Zayd says to Amr, Zawajtuka muliyati hindan. So I married you off to uh, the lady who I represent, okay? So I'm her guardian, him, okay? So Amr says, Qabiltu tazwijaha. I've accepted her in marriage. In a Shafi'i Madhab, you have to say in marriage. You can't say I've accepted. It doesn't count. 
So it's uh, most other madahib, it's enough. The Shafi'i madahib, you have to say in marriage, you have to be specific on what you have accepted. It. So it's very, um, they're very specific on the wording and, and everything regarding marriage. <clears throat> um, okay. Inshallah, that's enough for today. Take any questions? So now to override the father is extreme, it's hard, it's difficult. It can't just be done. What a lot of people do in Arab and even here, people do it now, is they say, oh, if he doesn't marry Oksan, that's why I agree, then they have the idea that his wilaya, his guardianship, disappears. And I can go to anyone else. And the way it's implemented today is actually very disrupt disruptive and it is not correct. The wilaya of the father doesn't go unless they fall into fifth. What's fifth? So openly disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That only happens if they continue to refuse someone with all the conditions again and again and again. Then the ruler might declare them to be fast. Okay? But generally, just by refusing someone doesn't make them not the way they anyway. So the general case is that the wilaya is still there unless, um, you know, the Islamic ruler declares that it's gone. So they can't just lift it off someone like that. Um, if Now, the father doesn't have the right to refuse someone who is a kufa, who, is, um, who isn't lower than the daughter's standard in her religious state, in her lineage, in, um, you know, um, status in the community, in the job they work. But if they so if they refuse them for a legitimate reason, the daughter has no right to um to uh, to complain. If they refuse them even though they have a religious reason, then yes, she might complain to the to the hakim, to the wali, to, to the wali, to the qadi over. Then they could pressure the husband, the father to get her to marry. In some cases, yes, he can be overridden. If he continues to refuse, but that's not the general case. Okay. Yeah, a very, and a very dangerous way. I just once, just had one time, he didn't accept what I want, even though the condition's not even there. The person's not even a kufa, yeah, which is very dangerous. And, and yeah, and that's, uh, it caused a lot of problems, especially in, in, in Muslim countries. I find that a lot that there's rulings in, like there's law that's put in place uh, that superficial, it doesn't really, it's not practical. And the person, the judge, doesn't understand the rulings very well. So they find it very easy to just remove people and stuff, which causes a problem. The other awliya, removing them is not a big, a big an issue. Okay? But the father in Islam has a, has a very high um, level of wilaya because generally, generally, okay, the father, the instinct of the father is that they care for the daughter to be in the best situation. That's the general case, okay? Now, yes, there is people, there is exemptions, but we're talking about the general ruling is that father cares more for the daughter, so have a strong state of, of wilaya over the daughter. Um. No. It, 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 it. So I um take a look at the slide. It's not happening. Yeah, the sister of your half brother. Yeah. So, um, someone, let's say, your half brother has, um, he's your brother through your one of your parents, not through the other parents. Okay. And they also have a, uh, they have a sister from a different 
parent, not from the same parent as you. So that sister doesn't have the same mother or father as you. That's the third thing. And I'm just let's check the chat. Okay. So inshallah, So inshallah, um, we'll see everyone in on the seventh. Inshallah, Taala. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to